Dr. Sage here. This begins a series of three videos where I describe the cell membrane. Alright, so why do you spend so much time talking about cell membranes? The reason is because all cells are built out of membranes. Every single cell has a plasma membrane, whether it's a eukaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell. Also, eukaryotic cells have lots of membranes inside the cell. The organelles are made up of membranes, like the nuclear envelope for the nucleus. Okay, so let's begin by discussing the basic structure of membranes. So recall that the plasma membrane is the boundary of the cell, the barrier of the cell, which separates what is the cell from what is not the cell, from the environment around the cell. The plasma membrane exhibits selective permeability. What that means is some things can cross the plasma membrane and other things cannot and things do need the ability to cross the plasma membrane. The cell needs to be able to bring in food or energy. The cell needs to be able to bring in oxygen. The cell has to be able to get rid of waste products like carbon dioxide. Now recall, the basics of a membrane is it's a phospholipid bilayer. Remember, phospholipids are amphipathic molecules. That means they have two opposite chemical properties. They have the hydrophilic water-loving heads and the hydrophobic water-hating tails. So the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, meaning there's two layers of phospholipids. The center of the membrane where the tails are, that is going to be hydrophobic, it hates water. The periphery of the membrane where the heads are, that's going to be hydrophilic, they love water. And they're going to be facing out towards the water. But this is a little more realistic depiction of a membrane. Because a membrane is not just a series of phospholipids. There's other things embedded in and on the membrane. For example, one of the things embedded in and on membranes are proteins. The proteins are these blue blobs you can see in this figure here. Now of note, the proteins are given different names depending on how they're interacting with the membrane. So you could have a protein that is not embedded or stuck in the membrane at all. Like it's not in the hydrophobic portion of the membrane at all like this protein right here okay that would be called a peripheral membrane protein then you can have proteins that are embedded into the membrane like these two here either embedded part way into the membrane but not passing through all the way to the other side or one that does span the membrane crosses all the way from one side to the other those are called integral membrane proteins now although it's a little confusing one of these integral membrane proteins is also given a special name. The integral membrane protein that spans the membrane that crosses all the way from one side to the other, that more specifically is called a transmembrane protein. Okay, so those are what the names we give the proteins based on how they're interacting with the membrane. Now, we'll learn in much greater details in later chapters the functions of proteins, like what the proteins are doing inside membranes. Basically, the different membranes inside the cells have different functions. Like your plasma membrane does something different than the membrane inside the mitochondria. The membrane inside the mitochondria does something different than the membrane inside the chloroplast. What gives these membranes their different functions is which proteins they have embedded in them. And we're going to learn about that as we go throughout this semester, but we're not going to learn those details right now. Besides the phospholipids and the proteins, there are other things that make up your membrane. For example, you can have carbohydrates stuck on your membrane. Okay, so these uh, little green things here, or these blue things here, those represent carbohydrates, like glucose molecules, or chains of glucose molecules. And those carbohydrates can be found in different places. You can find the carbohydrates stuck on a protein, like this one here, that's called a glycoprotein. So a glycoprotein is a protein with a carbohydrate attached to it. Remember, glucose, glycogen, those are carbohydrates. So a glycoprotein is a protein with a carbohydrate attached to it. Or the carbohydrates can be attached to a lipid, in which case it's called a glycolipid, a lipid with a carbohydrate attached to it. All right, in addition to the phospholipids and the proteins and the carbohydrates, we also have these things here. Those are cholesterol molecules. So there's cholesterol embedded in your membranes. In a minute, we'll talk about what the cholesterol is doing for your membrane. Now, this represents the plasma membrane of an animal cell. This would be inside the animal cell where you find things like the cytoskeleton. This would be outside the animal cell where you find the extracellular matrix. Okay, so that's a little more realistic depiction of a membrane. 
but it's still not entirely accurate. Why? Because this is a static image. Things aren't moving. In reality, the membrane is not static. When most people think about a membrane, because they think it's like the barrier of the cell, the boundary of the cell, they think of a stiff, rigid, solid object. But that's not correct. Membranes are not solids. Membranes are actually fluids, and they have to be fluids in order to function. So, because it's not a solid, it's a fluid, what that means is these molecules are not locked into place. Like these phospholipids here, they don't stay in this spot. These phospholipids are moving laterally, which means in this figure, left and right, 10 million times every single second. So they're not rigidly locked into place, they are in motion. Now, it doesn't happen very often, but once in a while, a phospholipid will flip-flop from one side to the other side of the membrane. But that's only about once per month versus 10 million times per second it's moving laterally. So this membrane is not a solid, it's a fluid. And membranes must be fluid to work properly. They're usually about as fluid as like olive oil. But there are things that can affect how solid-like or how liquid-like a membrane is. One of the things that can affect that is temperature. Okay, so as temperature gets colder, what happens is the membrane becomes more solid-like. As the temperature gets warmer, what happens is the membrane becomes more liquid-like. Now recall that membrane is largely phospholipids, okay, which is a type of lipid. Remember from the chapter where we learned about macromolecules, phospholipids are a type of lipid. Well, we talked about another type of lipid in that chapter, fat, triglyceride, and you have interacted with that in regards to temperature. For example, butter. Butter is fat or triglyceride, it's a type of lipid. Now, if you have your butter in your fridge at a cold temperature, it's a very hard solid. You take that butter out and leave it out at room temperature and it becomes a soft solid. You heat it up even more and it becomes a liquid. So the warmer that butter is, the more liquid like it is. The colder that butter is, the more solid like it is. Okay, so that's a lipid, fat or triglyceride, and how temperature affects it. Well, the same thing happens in your membrane, because your membrane is also made out of lipids, phospholipids. So the warmer your membrane is, the more fluid-like it is. The colder your membrane is, the more solid-like it is. Now, temperature is not the only thing that affects how solid-like or fluid-like a membrane is. Another thing that affects it is the fatty acid tails on those phospholipids. Again, recall back to the macromolecules chapter, we talked about the fatty acid tails and now they can be saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids. In particular, we talked about that in regards to fat or triglyceride. And we talked about how things like butter is a saturated fatty acid and it forms long straight fatty acid tails that can pack very tightly together. So because they're packed tightly together, it tends to be a solid at room temperature. In contrast, olive oil, which is also triglyceride, just like butter, is an unsaturated fatty acid. So instead of those tails being long straight tails, they're kinked, so they cannot pack as tightly together. Okay, And because of that, it tends to be a liquid at room temperature. Well, the same thing happens with the fatty acid tails on phospholipids. If the fatty acid tails are saturated fatty acid tails, they form long straight chains and they can pack very tightly together. If the fatty acid tails are unsaturated fatty acid tails, they form kinks of the chain, and because of that, they cannot pack as tightly together. So these ones that pack more tightly together, they're more solid-like. These ones that do not pack as tightly together, they're more liquid-like. Okay, so the membranes can be more solid or more liquid depending on the percentage of saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids on the phospholipids. Now, some organisms even take advantage of that to help them live in different environments. For example, let's say you go catch a fish living off of the waters near Alaska, where it gets very cold. Well, that fish has a problem. That cold temperature starts to turn its membrane more solid-like. Okay, well, the fish, just like you, needs its membrane to be fluid. So, that fish is going to have more unsaturated fatty acids to help their membrane stay more fluid-like under those cold temperatures. 
Now, go catch a fish off of the water is near like the Gulf of Mexico, near Florida, where it doesn't need to worry about it getting cold because it doesn't get cold, and that fish can have more saturated fatty acids making up its cell membranes because it doesn't need to worry about those colder temperatures turning its cell membranes to solid-like. The third thing that affects how solid-like or fluid-like a membrane is, is cholesterol. So remember I said you have cholesterol embedded in your membranes. Well, cholesterol actually does two different things depending on the temperature. At warmer temperatures, cholesterol helps the membrane to stay a little more solid-like. We're not going to focus on that one. What I want you to focus on is what happens under cold temperatures. Under cold temperatures, what cholesterol does is it helps the membrane to stay more fluid-like. Why? Because it prevents these phospholipids from packing tightly together because this cholesterol is in the way. So it helps the membrane stay more fluid-like under cold temperatures. Okay, so that's a basic introduction to the structure of membranes and what determines if a membrane is more solid-like or more fluid-like. In the next video, we're going to start discussing how things can cross a membrane by learning about diffusion and osmosis. So until then, this has been Dr. Sage.